na desdk krupskaya on communist ethics written 1924 to 1936 source communist morality compiled by n bychkova r lavrov and v lubishova progress publishers 1962 from the speech at the 6th Congress of the Russian Leninist Young Communist League. July 12, 1924. We should try to link our personal lives with the cause for which we struggle, with the cause of building communism. This, of course, does not mean that we should renounce our personal life. The party of communism is not a sect, and so such asceticism should not be advocated. At a factory, I once heard a woman addressing her workmates say, Comrades working women, you should remember that once you join the party you have to give up husband and children. Of course, this is not the approach to the question. It is not a matter of neglecting husband and children, but of training the children to become fighters for communism, to arrange things so that the husband becomes such a fighter, too. One has to know how to merge one's life with the life of society. This is not asceticism. On the contrary, the fact of this merging, the fact that the common cause of all working people becomes a personal matter, makes personal life richer. It does not become poorer, it offers deep and colorful experiences which humdrum family life has never provided. To know how to merge one's life with work for communism, with the work and struggle of the working people to build communism, is one of the tasks that face us. You, young people, are only just starting out on your lives, and you can build them so that there is no gap between your personal life and that of society. From the article Lenin as a Man Lenin was a revolutionary Marxist and collectivist to the depths of his being. All his life and work was devoted to one great goal the struggle for the triumph of socialism. This left its imprint on all his thoughts and feelings. He had none of the pettiness, petty envy, anger, revengefulness and vanity so much to be found in small property-minded individualists. Lenin fought, he put questions sharply, in argument he introduced nothing personal but approached questions from the point of view of the matter in question. And, because of this, comrades were not usually offended at his sharp manner. He observed people closely, listened to what they had to say, tried to grasp the essential point, and so he was able, out of a number of insignificant points, to catch the nature of the person, he was able to approach people with remarkable sensitivity, to find in them all that was good and of value and could be put to the service of the common cause. I often noticed how after meeting Ilyich people became different, and for this the comrades loved Ilyich and he himself gained as much from his meetings with them, as very few people could gain. Not everyone can learn from life, from other people. Ilyich knew how to. He never used artifice or diplomacy in dealing with people, never hoodwinked them, and people sensed his sincerity and candor. Concern for his comrades was characteristic of him. He was concerned about them when he was in prison, at liberty, in exile, in emigration and when he became chairman of the Council of People's Commissars. He was concerned not only about his comrades, but even about people complete strangers who needed his help. The only letter to me from Milich which I have preserved contains this phrase. The letters for help which sometimes come to you I read and try to do what is possible. This was in the summer of 1919, when Illich had more than enough other concerns. The civil war was at its height. In the same letter he wrote, It seems the whites are in control of the Crimea again. There were more than enough things to see to, but I never heard Illich say he had no time, when it was a matter of helping people. He was always telling me that I should be more concerned about the comrades I worked with than once, when during a party purge one of my workers from the People's Commissariat for Education was unjustly attacked, he found time to look through back numbers of publications in order to find material confirming that the worker, even before October, when still a member of the Bund, had defended the Bolsheviks. Lenin was kind, some people say. 
but the word kind from the old language of virtue hardly suits Illich, it is somehow inadequate and inaccurate. The family or group clannishness so characteristic of the old days was alien to Illich. He never separated the personal from the social. With him it was all merged into one. He could never have loved a woman whose views differed from his own, who was not his comrade in work. He had a habit of becoming passionately attached to people. His attachment to Pelekhana from whom he got so much, was typical in this respect, but it never prevented him from fighting hard against Pelekhana when he saw that Pelekhana was wrong, that his point of view harmed the cause, it did not prevent him from breaking completely with him when Pelekhana became a defensist. Successful work delighted Ilyich. Work for the cause was the mainspring of his life, what he loved and what carried him away. Lenin tried to get as close as he could to the masses and he was able to do so. Association with workers gave him a very great deal. It gave him a real understanding of the tasks of the struggle of the proletariat at every stage. If we attentively study how Lenin worked as a scholar, a propagandist, a man of letters, an editor and organizer, we shall also understand him as a man. From the article Lenin on Communist Morality. Lenin was of the generation that grew up under the influence of Pisarev, Shedrin, Nekrasov, Dobrilyabov, and Chernyshevsky, of the revolutionary democratic poets of the 60s. The Iskra poets mercilessly ridicule the survivals of the old serfdom, they flee depravity, servility, toadying, double dealing, philistinism, and bureaucratic methods. The writers of the 1860s advocated making a closer study of life and disclosing the survivals of the old feudal system. From his earliest years Lenin loathed philistinism, gossip, feudal time wasting, family life separated from social interests, making women a plaything, an amusement, or a submissive slave. He despised the sort of life that is full of insincerity and easy adaptation to circumstances. Ilyich was particularly fond of Chernyshevsky's novel What is to be done? He loved the keen satire of Shedrin, loved the Iskra poets, many of whose verses he knew by heart, and he loved Nekrasov. For many long years Vladimir Ilyich had to live in emigration in Germany, Switzerland, England and France. He went to workers' meetings, looked closely at the lives of the workers, saw how they lived at home and spent their leisure hours in cafes or out walking. Abroad we lived pretty poorly, for the most part lodging in cheap hired rooms where all kinds of people lived, we were bearded by a variety of landladies and ate in cheap restaurants. Elich was very fond of the Paris cafes, wherein democratic songs singers sharply criticized bourgeois democracy and the day-to-day -day aspect of life. Alich particularly liked the songs of Montagus, the sons of a communard, who wrote good verses about life in the Faubourgs, city outskirts. Alich once met and talked with Montagus at an evening party, and they conversed long after midnight about the revolution, the workers' movement and how socialism would create a new, socialist way of life. Vladimir Ilyich always closely associated the questions of morality with those of the world outlook. In his speech on October 2, 1920, at the Third Congress of the Young Communist League, Vladimir Ilyich dwelt on communist morality, gave simple, concrete examples to explain the essence of communist morality. He told his audience that feudal and bourgeois morality is downright deception the hoodwinking and befooling of workers and peasants in the interests of the landlords and capitalists, and that communist morality derives from the interests of the class struggle of the proletariat. He said that communist morality should aim at raising human society to a higher level, getting rid of the exploitation of labor. At the root of communist morality lies the struggle to strengthen and finally achieve communism. Lenin gave concrete examples to show the importance of solidarity, the ability to master oneself, to work tirelessly for what is needed to consolidate the new social system, the need for great and conscious discipline to this end, 
the need for strong solidarity in the fulfillment of set tasks. Illich told the young people that it was necessary for them to devote all their work, all their efforts to the common cause. And Lenin's own life was a model of how this should be done. Illich could not live any other way, he did not know how to. But he was not an ascetic, he loved skating and fast cycling, mountain climbing and hunting, he loved music and life and all its many-sided beauty, he loved his comrades, loved people in general. Everyone knows of his simplest The Politburo, who are helping the masses to build socialism. It is not a matter of chance, therefore, that the unprincipled bloc of Kamenefans in Lviv together with Trotsky have pushed them from one step to another into a deep abyss of an unheard betrayal of Lenin's work, the work of the masses, the ideals of socialism. Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev and their entire band of killers acted together with the German fascists, entered into a pact with the Gestapo. That is why the country unanimously demanded that these mad dogs be shot. Reading about their depositions in the court the workers are saying, they wanted to re-establish the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. They forgot about us, about the masses. They forget, would we have let them come to power, they also forget that socialism is alive, it is a creation of the masses. They forgot this and became the front ranks of the counter-revolutionary bourgeoisie. They wanted to create unrest in the ranks of the masses, kill the brain and heart of the revolution, comrade Stalin himself. This did not happen. This despicable gang of scoundrels has been shot. Now the masses are rallying around the party even more closely. Their love for Stalin has grown. Even people who are not members of the party are writing that it is necessary to bring out the collected works of Lenin and Stalin as supplementary reading in newspapers which have a wide circulation. Social consciousness, a thirst for knowledge is rising further. A school in Pushkino for adults imparting higher education has been built. It is amazing, they are giving the finishing touches to the roof. This is what I was told recently by a senior economic manager, who was my student 40 years ago in a Sunday evening school. He had served a term in the prison, had also created a collective already in 1918 in his native village and been conferred with the million ruble prize for exemplary work in the collective farm where he was appointed as director. Yes. The socialist structure is growing and so also the cultural requirements of the masses. We have to be in step with these requirements, strengthen the schools for adults, widen their network, widen the access to libraries, build centers of culture, clubs in the collective farms, museums. At the given stage the maximum importance should be given to the quality of education, to the libraries the reader clubs and centers of culture. With the organizers in various areas of production, with the collective farmers, workers, the combine workers, the beet growers etc. Everybody can see how in the foundation of these economic organizations the friendship amongst people is strengthening in this country of Soviets, how the masses have grown culturally. And millions of workers can see how selflessly, Completely and without a break, Comrade Stalin is giving himself to their vital work, the work of Lenin, the work of building socialism, how he is leading them forward towards a better life. They can see this and they believe him and engulf him with all-encompassing trust and love. We already have a rich experience in this area. Through the years since the October Socialist Revolution the key initiative in the field of culture has come from the workers and those areas which suffered a setback where because many difficulties were not taken into account, the desired and the anticipatory being looked upon as already existing in the present. Now we have learned to look at life with a sharper eye, to hate the remnants of the past with more vigor. We have strengthened our understanding that it is necessary to acquire deeper and wider knowledge and to learn to apply this knowledge correctly. We are seeing that the work of building socialism is not weakening for a single moment. It is carrying on with more strength and more harmony.
It is not a coincidence that the international is being torn to pieces, that the Trotsky's Inovif gang of killers is raising its shield in attempting to wreck the People's Front. The Dabruk ears and the Citrines are supporting all kinds of subversive activities which the enemies instigate against the working class of the USSR, its party and leaders. They occupied the first place in screaming out anti-Soviet slogans, which are being voiced by the bourgeois world. The Third International was created as a result of struggle with the Second International. The Second International was carrying out a violent propaganda against the dictatorship of the proletariat and Soviet power with the help of the renegade Kautsky and company. The Second International wishes to justify and defend the capitalist system, to blindfold the A's of the working masses. That is why they are defending the Gestapo agent, Trotsky. It has not worked out. Our country of Soviets has become powerful. The banner of communism is rising higher and higher, and moving ahead with firm steps on the path laid out by Marx, Engels and Lenin. Neither the Trotskyites, nor the Zinovifs or the Second International will be able to hide the true facts, or will be successful in blowing dust into the eyes of the workers. The tense atmosphere brewing in the International Front, the threatening danger of war, all these situations sharpen the vision of the workers. The People's Front of the workers all over the world will grow and become stronger. Is Vestia 4th of September 1936, number 224.